Welcome to Worship with Jefferson United Methodist Church this morning. We are glad to have you with us, even if online. So I ask you to join with me in preparing your hearts for worship. We look to the rulers of this earth. We look for leadership, we look for wisdom, and we look for strength. We look to these bodies of ours for stability and fulfillment and joy. We look to our families and our friends for love and compassion and hope. When rulers betray, when bodies fail, and when families disappoint, God offers another look. God will guide us. God's spirit will sustain us. Christ will welcome us home. Come, my sisters and brothers, we are all God's family now. Come, my sisters and brothers, let us worship God together.
I know there are many people that are grieving about many things, including you know, just missing people. You know, I'm anticipating some grief coming up, you know, as, as it is time for me to move on to another church. And so I also want to share with you, we, um, we had to put our dog to sleep, our dog Nora, to sleep this week because um, she ended up with cancer. So um, we're grieving that as well. And so I'd like to pray with all of you who are experiencing anything of that nature. Let's pray. Holy God, I ask that you pick up the broken pieces of our heart and we trust them to your care because we can't put it back together ourselves. We know that you are the master puzzler. You can put the pieces back together and when you are finished, we are stronger. We are more beautiful, we are more courageous, whatever it is that you've set us up to be. We trust you and you alone. We also lift before you all those who are suffering due to issues of race. They are afraid for their children to go out in the neighborhood that they see people being afraid of them, even when they're just normal human beings. So Lord, we ask you to heal that grief as well, that you help us to be allies that help to bring peace and reconciliation. Again, it's too big of a problem to do without you. So we follow you we make decisions and speak up as Jesus would. Because if we're not with Jesus, we are against Jesus. So Lord, we place ourselves and all things in this world in your hands. And now we pray as your son taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
brothers and sisters in Christ. You have been so faithful in your giving, whether you've given online, whether you have had your bank send a check, whether you're part of the ACH movement of sending directly on a regular basis uh, from your bank account an offering to the church you have, or whether you've done online giving, you have allowed this congregation to do ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. You have enabled us to get ready to, for a new start with Kathy Clark. So we are thanking you for that as we come to our time of offering. And I always offer the prayer before the giving when we're online. So let us pray. Help me, Lord. I must let go. For so long I have held to the habit of holding on. Even my muscles are tense. Deeply fearful are they of relaxing, lest they fall away from their place. I cling clutchingly to my friends, lest I lose them. I live under the shadow of being supplanted by another. I cling to my money, not so much by a wise economy and a thoughtful spending, but by a sense of possession that makes me depend on it for strength. I must let go. I must let go of everything but you, God. But God, may it not be that you are in all the things to which I cling. That may be the hidden reason for my clinging. It is all very puzzling indeed. When I say I must let go of everything but God, what is my meaning? I must relax my hold on everything that dulls my sense of you that comes between me and the inner awareness of your presence, pervading my life and glorifying you. All the common ways with wonderful wonder. Teach me, O oh God, how to free myself of my dearest possessions, so that in my trust I shall find restored to me all I need to walk in thy path and to fulfill your will. Let me know you for myself, that I may not be satisfied with anything that is less. Amen.
fill my trophies at last I lay down I will To whom shall I speak and give warning that they might hear? Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. That's from Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 10. Rules. Every home has rules. Some are kind of strange rules. Some are very stringent and strict. Some homes is almost non-existent. Some have goofy rules. You know, when you have a white carpet, you have different rules for the room where that white carpet is, right? Probably no grape juice in there or even wine. Uh, it, my uh, husband, Frank, his Aunt Madeline had her living room cover furniture covered with plastic and sometimes the kids would run through there you know because they weren't allowed to it was the rules were you stayed out of that room and you didn't sit on it and everything was perfectly positioned and perfectly laid out like a magazine you know in those kind of houses you're almost afraid to breathe almost afraid to relax because it's too perfect. In our sanctuaries, we have rules too. If, we're, if we were there in the 
sanctuary of our building and I started passing out cinnamon rolls and beverages, there are some of you that would get pretty nervous about that. <laughs> and then if I started playing music, say classical or rock, not hymns, you know, there there would be some some questioning going on. First, you know, we getting shaken up with food and beverage in the sanctuary. Sometimes we are more concerned about keeping our sanctuaries pristine than we are about welcoming people. It's something we don't do, eat in the sanctuary. Why don't we eat in the sanctuary? Is, does the church exist to keep the sanctuary pristine? Or does the church exist for mission and ministry and the sanctuary is a tool to help us do that? Isn't it more important to be warm and welcoming than keep the sanctuary spotless? The Pharisees said no. Jesus said yes. What about a choice of music? Music actually requires a little chaos. If it's too orderly or neat and tidy, it doesn't work. It gets very boring. It needs passion. It needs emotion. It needs upheaval. It needs sometimes higher volume, sometimes lower volume. It needs pauses and stops and harmony and dissonance. Beethoven is known as one of the greatest composers in history. When he was composing his fifth symphony, he wrote in surprise loud notes every so often. He wanted to jolt people out of their expectations. He wanted this element of surprise to stir them up and shake them up a little bit. And don't we need to be surprised and shaken up a little bit? The Pharisees said no. Jesus said yes. When we think of church or we think of religion, we often think of order and organization. We think of right and wrong. Do this, don't do that. We assume that God is orderly and the evil one is chaotic and disruptive. We assume the Messiah is to bring a message, not a mess. But the Messiah tells us something different. According to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is the disruptive one. The Holy Spirit shakes things up, stirs the waters, turns lives upside down. Healing and restoration are so messy and rule-breaking. We can see that right now with the protests that are going on. They're messy. There's, there's healing and restoration that needs to happen. Last week was Pentecost the birthday of the church, and we celebrate the Holy Spirit. We're still in the Pentecost season, but we often think of the Holy Spirit about once a year, one Sunday a year during, on Pentecost itself, even though the Holy Spirit's presence is all, it's there all year round. We are supposed to keep Pentecost the same way we keep Lent or Advent. In, script, in our scripture today, the Holy Spirit is at play in Jesus, the Messiah. It is the Holy Spirit that yields the tremendous healing and grace to all who follow that day. Listen to the story of Jesus as Matthew tells it in chapter 12. When Jesus has, in chapter 9, he's just healed a lot of people and one after another, and the Pharisees are looking on and they're claiming that it was a bunch of hocus pocus, that it was from Satan. And then, starting at verse 15, Jesus, knowing they were out to get him, moved on. A lot of people followed him and he healed them all. He also cautioned them to keep it quiet, following guidelines set down by Isaiah. Look well at my hand-picked servant. I love him so much, take such delight in him. I've placed my spirit on him. He'll decree justice to the nations, but he won't yell, won't raise his voice. 
There will be no commotion in the streets. He won't walk over anyone's feelings. He won't push you into a corner. Before you know it, his justice will triumph. The mere sound of his name will signal hope, even among far-off believers. Next, a poor demon-afflicted wretch, both blind and deaf, was set down before him. Jesus healed him, gave him his sight and hearing. The people who saw it were impressed. This has to be the son of David. But the Pharisees, when they heard the report, were cynical. Black magic, they said. Some devil trick he's pulled from his sleeve. Jesus confronted their slander. A judge who gives opposite verdicts on the same person cancels himself out. A family that's in a constant squabble disintegrates. If Satan banishes Satan, is there any Satan left? If you're slinging devil mud at me, calling me a devil kicking out devils, doesn't the same mud stick to your own exorcists? But if it's by God's power that I'm sending the evil spirits packing, then God's kingdom is here for sure. How in the world do you think it's possible in broad daylight to enter the house of an awake, able-bodied man and walk off with his possessions unless you tie him up first? Tie him up, though, and you can clean him out. This is war, and there is no neutral ground. If you're not on my side, you're the enemy. If you're not helping, you're making things worse. There's nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. But if you deliberately persist in your slanders against God's spirit, you are repudiating the very one who forgives. If you reject the Son of Man out of some misunderstanding, the Holy Spirit can forgive you. But when you reject the Holy Spirit, you're sawing off the branch on which you're sitting, severing by your own perversity all the connection with the one who forgives. If you grow a healthy tree, you'll pick a healthy fruit. If you grow a diseased tree, you'll pick worm-eaten fruit. The fruit tells you about the tree. You have minds like a snake pit. How do you suppose what you say is worth anything when you are so foul-minded? It's your heart, not the dictionary, that gives meaning to your words. A good person produces good deeds and words, season after season. An evil person is a blight on the orchard. Let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. Later, a few religion scholars and Pharisees got on him. Teacher, we want to see your credentials. Give us some hard evidence that God is in this. How about a miracle? Remember, they had just seen miracles just minutes before. And Jesus said, you're looking for proof, but you're looking for the wrong kind. All you want is something to titillate your curiosity, satisfy your lust for miracles. The only proof you're going to get is what looks like the absence of proof. Jonah evidence. Like Jonah, three days and nights in the fish's belly, the Son of Man will be gone three days and nights in a deep grave. On Judgment Day, the Ninevites will stand up and give evidence that will condemn this generation because when Jonah preached to them, they changed their lives. A far greater preacher than Jonah is here, and you squabble about proofs. On Judgment Day, the Queen of Sheba will come forward and bring evidence that will con condemn this generation because she traveled from a far corner of the earth to listen to wise Solomon. Wisdom far greater than Solomon's is right in front of you, and you quibble over evidence. When a defiling evil spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts along through the desert looking for an oasis, but some unsuspecting soul it can be devil. When it doesn't find anyone, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. On return, it finds the person spotlessly clean but vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all move in, whooping it up. 
that person ends up far worse off than if he'd never gotten cleaned up in the first place. That's what this generation is like. You may think you have cleaned out the junk from your lives and gotten ready for God, but you weren't hospitable to my kingdom message. And now all the devils are moving back in. While he was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers showed up. They were outside trying to get a message to him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are out here wanting to speak with you. Jesus didn't respond directly, but said, who do you think my mother and brothers are? He then stretched out his hand toward his disciples. Look closely. These are my mother and brothers. Obedience is thicker than blood. The person who obeys my heavenly father's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this story, we have a turf war going on between the Pharisees and Jesus. And the crowd is the audience. The, the Pharisees are very orderly fellows. They have at least 613 commandments that they follow diligently and a huge number of supplemental rules and regulations from hand washing to regulating the, the utensils that they use for milk and meat. Do this at the right time, do that in the right way, pray certain prayers, dress certain ways, eat like this, don't eat this other thing. The Pharisees enforced so many laws that it was virtually impossible for people to live within the law consistently or perfectly. The Pharisees revealed in their own perfection, reveled in their own perfection, that they judged harshly those who didn't live up to their imposed ideals. And that might sound like somebody you know, somebody who judges harshly when you don't live up to a certain standard. In contrast, Jesus is somewhat disorderly, just like John the baptizer. People didn't line up in a neat line to get baptized. Jesus loved to feast and to drink instead of fasting. He loved to hang out with unclean people. He forgave people that everyone knew should be excluded from the kingdom. And who was he to forgive sins in the first place? He ate with unwashed hands. He broke the Sabbath laws. He healed people and vanquished demons, but he did this on the wrong days. That's only part of it. There were huge disorderly groups of people who followed him everywhere he went. No one wanted to listen to the Pharisees with their orderly rules. They weren't interesting anymore especially since Jesus and his disorderly crew started stirring things up. Religion has become chaos since this Jesus guy showed up. The Holy Spirit is not your orderly, impassive, unruffled, keep everything the same kind of God. The Holy Spirit stirs the pot and makes things messy. The Holy Spirit challenges the status quo. The Holy Spirit messes up your life. Because if you want an orderly, safe, predictable life, the Holy Spirit doesn't let that happen. So don't follow Jesus if you want an orderly and predictable. There's a line in the movie Moonstruck where the main character says, love doesn't make things neat and tidy and perfect. Love messes everything up. And in the same way, Jesus messes everything up. We can't just go back to doing things the way we've always done them. He is the greatest disturber of the peace who ever lived and lives. If Jesus is not disturbing your life, not troubling your mind in some way, if he's not in there making your categories untidy, then maybe it's not Jesus you're following. Resurrection life is not about living according to 613 rules and then some. It's not about living a moral life or a regulated life or a good life. Resurrection life is about receiving a gift that changes all of your life. The gift of life through death, of grace greater than any evil 
any sin. Jesus didn't come to change the world by changing just the surface of humanity, just the outside skin, not just the facial expression. Jesus came to change the world by changing the heart of humanity. That's open heart surgery. That's blood on the floor. Jesus shakes things up. Jesus cuts and he heals. He messes up the best plans and the best guarded goals. And we find from the scripture, the worst thing we can do, the worst thing is to demonize the work of the Holy Spirit. Are you a Pharisee? Or are you a Jesus follower? Some of us who claim to be Jesus followers are really Pharisees at heart. And maybe we need a Pharisectomy. That's a word used by Peter Haas in his book, How to Joyfully Remove Your Inner Pharisee and Other Religiously Transmitted Diseases. It's a great, great uh, title, isn't it? How's your life? How's your church? Is it tidy and organized and perfectly in place? Are you doing the same things the same ways they've been done for decades? You may need a pharisectomy to make the spirit free to move. We've always done it this way, or we never did it that way before. They're related comments. They're called the seven last words of the church. When the church changes for the better, the church will have an overflowing platter that spills all over the floor. When you have a church that's more interested in pleasing itself and what it likes instead of pleasing God, what kind of church is that? If you have a church that values pleasing people in the church instead of reaching people outside the church, what kind of church is that? Jesus wants to tell us this. The church does not exist for itself and for its own glory. That would be classic Phariseeism. The church exists to be the redeeming, healing voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice that unlocks the voices of those unheard, the voice that opens eyes that could not see before. What does your house look like? Is it tidy and untouched, draped in plastic, that nobody's allowed in the room? Or is it messy with the love and the transformation of the Holy Spirit moving in your life? Jesus tells us in this scripture that our houses should be too t- shouldn't be too tidy. That's an invitation for the evil one to move in and bring friends, take up residence. When f- the focus is on neatness of the house instead of the people that it will reach, bad things can happen. The church is about people and relationships. Like Jesus, the church is about spending time with people who need Jesus' love and grace the most, without falling into attacks, judgment, and name-calling. And most of all, without calling the changing, challenging work of the Holy Spirit wrong. Because once we do those things, we have failed our mission as disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus says you are either with him or against him. Being with Jesus doesn't mean everything will be comfortable. In fact, you can expect lots of things that make you uncomfortable. You can expect a challenge to your preconceived ideas of the way things should be. If you're with Jesus, you can expect to make some enemies. Because there are plenty of Pharisees out there who love rules more than they love Jesus. And for those... They need a pharisectomy. Disciples of Jesus, is the Lord in your house? Is the Lord in this house? Indeed, the Lord is in the house. Amen. My strength, my song, 
This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when tears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you as you go forward into this week to be his people everywhere you go. In Jesus' name, amen.